Okay, so lines 2A and 2B, alimony received. So now you've got a taxpayer receiving alimony. Enter amounts received as alimony or separate maintenance pursuant percent to a divorce or separation agreement entered into on or before. Here's the cutoff date, December 31st, 2018. Unless the agreement was changed after December 31st, 2018 to expressly provide that alimony received isn't included in your income. So in other words, before December 31st, 2018, if you were trying to make your agreement from a separation, a divorce in that type of situation, you've got this, this weird thing where if the payment is being categorized as child support, then the person paying it might not be able to get the deduction and the person receiving it might not have to record it in income. But if it's alimony, then uh, if it's categorized as alimony, then the person that is paying it might get a deduction and when they get the deduction, when they claim the deduction, they would generally put the social security number of the person receiving the money, the other spouse, the ex-spouse, in a similar way as you would have with a 1099, the IRS having the same kind of influence they have in business transactions, pressuring the one that gets the tax benefit. All the information, including tax benefits, is in here. The payer to tell them who they paid so they can go after the recipient for the taxes in that transaction. And the one that got the money would have to include it in income. Now you can see that kind of makes the agreement between the two more complicated because you would think that you would just figure out then what the tax consequences would be and work that into your separation agreement to, to determine what the payments would be and so on and so forth that would be fair. After 2018, they've, they basically kind of removed that so that you, so whether it's categorized as child support or alimony, then the person that is paying doesn't get the deduction and the person that's receiving isn't going to have to include an in income. So you can kind of think, well, maybe that's harsh on the person that's paying because they don't get a deduction anymore. But again, to me, that would just mean that if you made the contract under the new agreement, you would just adjust the payments to take into consideration that now the tax law doesn't allow you a deduction. It would be a simplified agreement and you would expect that the agreement would look different than it would if the tax code was was structured, you know, in, in the in the other way. But obviously, if you made the if you made the decision before 2018, December 31st, 2018, then you had to structure it given the tax law at that point in time, unless you unless you changed it after that. Okay, so alimony received is not included in your income if you entered into a divorce or separation agreement and after December 31st, 2018. If you are including alimony in your income, you must let the person who made the payments know your social security number. If you don't, uh, you may have to pay a penalty. <laughs> For more details, see publication 504. So if you're including it in income, then you would expect the person that's paying it would have gotten a deduction. And it's kind of like if you were doing contracting work for a company, you have to give them your number, your social security or EIN number so that they on their end can take the deduction. So if, if you, if you, so right, that's the kind of uh, the, the thought process. Now there's also this definition between what is alimony versus child support. Not as big a problem of a definition given the fact that the tax, there's not as this big tax difference between the allocation between the two. But, uh, you know, the child support is, of course, the money that is being paid for the support of the child. And s oftentimes the separation or divorce agreement will be specific in being able to tell you what child support and alimony is, differentiating the two. But sometimes it's going to be vague. And then, and if that were the case, you would have to get into the nitty gritty and say, well, okay, uh, does does the payment stop happening once the child reaches an age of maturity, like 18 or something? If it does, you would expect that to be the child support portion. Uh, and, and if not, then it would be, you would expect maybe the alimony kind of portion. You'd have to kind of figure, figure out what's gonna be child support and what's gonna be alimony. I Obviously in a divorce type of situation, you wanna, you want the thing in a perfect world to be as clear and transparent to both parties so that it will cause the least amount of problems as people move forward with their lives going forward. But as we, that's not always the case, especially when lawyers are involved in a situation, right? And they get paid for bickering. The bickering is 
is their bread and butter. So in any case, if you are including alimony payments from uh, from more than one divorce or separation agreement in your income into the total of all alimony received on line 2A. So line 2B, on line 2B, enter the month and year of your uh, original divorce or separation agreement that relates to the alimony payment. Okay. Payment. If any, reported on line 2A. So now you're giving the date because that will help the IRS determine whether or not you're properly recording it due to the different laws that have been put in place on that cutoff date. So if you have alimony payments from more than one divorce or separation agreement on line 2B, enter the month and year of the divorce or separation agreement from which you received the most income, attach a statement listing the month and year of the other agreements. So you might have multiple <laughs> multiple alimonies and you're just, you got it. But in any case, that's the general idea. We'll take a look at some software examples in a future presentation.